What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Uncensored Podcast. And on today's episode, we got a really, really good, uh, good friend of mine. We go all the way back to undergrad. Uh, there's probably a few stories I'll, I'll leave out uh, so that they don't try to come get us post graduation. First, yeah, but uh, but now nah, um, we got Dev Dev Smith on the show. So Dev is someone who I've seen evolve. Uh, over really over the past almost nearly the past decade almost right um, just really stepping into his genius um, and, and being a, a connector right um, using his influence using his resources using his connections to elevate other people right you know he put a nice little bag in my pocket uh, through a relationship that he had so Dev is just that that genuine person who wants to see everybody win and it really help you own your creative genius and understanding how to navigate this evolving landscape of how the world is shifting uh, towards creatives, right? And, and the power that we have if you understand how to tap into it. So it's gonna be a great episode. You know, we always try to bring abstract ways of getting the bag and ownership and equity. And so this is probably the quintessential version of that in this particular episode. So with no further ado, Dev, what's going on, man? What's up, man? Pleasure to be here, man. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Absolutely, absolutely. Jacqueline, what's going on? Hey, how's it going? Deb, we're excited to have you on the Uncensored Show. Just to give a formal introduction, we are the go-to podcast for all things finance, business, and entrepreneurship, Uncensored style. So we're happy to have you again, Deb, and you're welcome to be Uncensored on our show. <laughs> all right, cool. So, you know, uh, as I mentioned, Dev makes a lot of power moves, but a lot of those moves... Uh, up until this point have kind of happened behind the scenes right people might not necessarily know who was making those moves so if you could i know the 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 population will begin to become a shrinking one over time but for those who don't know who dev is and what dev is all about just give us kind of a brief rundown on, on who dev is oh man so i feel like i'm about to give an elevator pitch uh <laughs> yeah so uh man i'm a i'm a writer uh, multimedia producer and a uh, digital marketing strategist. So um, I work at the intersection of uh, content production and strategy, right? So uh, what I like to do is is basically leverage um, the cultural insight that comes natural to me um, in combination with uh, the various amounts of, uh, of consumer data that's out there uh, to help different brands connect with their audiences in an authentic way. Um, and that phrase uh, connect with audiences in, in, a, in an authentic way is often like overused. Um, but I truly believe that um, I'm able to, uh, to help brands meet in the middle, right? We're at this place right now where audiences are more knowledgeable about, um, about marketing tactics than ever before, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, your consumer, whoever that might be, or your audience, whoever that might be, they know that they're being marketed to, right? They know that, you know what I mean? Like there's not any information they're receiving that is not uh, intentional, right? And, and, and we all know that. So the, the, the sweet spot is um, making that relationship um, feel less transactional and more um, of an actual relationship. We're all here to serve each other. Our audience and consumers are here to buy, brands and platforms are here to sell. We all know what we're here for, so let's like, let's just be natural about it instead of, you know, brands talking down from the mountaintops and people throwing their money at it. Let's connect, right? So I try to make sure I engineer um, situations and circumstances that create space for that that real authentic connection. Nah, that's dope, man. That's really dope. And you know, if you could, because again, I know we've had these offline conversations about the shift and you know where we're heading and where we are now yeah but if you could just kind of like give your perspective on this this evolution of creatives being able to like have more ownership um get equity let's like just walk us through that right so from where we're used to like we you know back when you know brand seems larger than life and you know we you know, there's so many barriers to entry. I even think about like IG Live, right? Like what it would cost to stream content to potentially millions of people, yeah. um, you know, 10 years ago, right? So just to kind of walk us through like that evolution, mm -hmm. right? How do we get here? And then what does that essentially mean for the creative, right? Who understands how to navigate this space? Yeah, okay. All right, so it all started with the, 
it all started with um with a convergence of you know what no let me rephrase that before i even started it all started with the decline of actual journalism right the reason i say that is because around i'll say what 2009 ish is when um brands realized that they needed to be they needed to become publishers right and that is when also when the ad revenue model um took over the media industry right and what's the ad revenue model it's when traffic um creates justification for um selling ad space right at that moment when that became you know when that became the popular business model for media platforms and media companies um, and brands adopted it as well um, that is what resulted in uh, the creator economy and the decline of journalism right what i mean by that is and i don't have the figures right in front of me i used to have them memorized but it's all good um what that what what that meant was um there was a steep decline in um actual journalists being being employed at these different media platforms right so if you're ramping up content right who's creating this content if it's not actual journalists right if it's not like and when i when i say journalists i mean people who are trained in the in the art of journalism who 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 um who um who's whose output is governed by journalistic principles you know what i mean thorough research um thorough information um being reliable and having some sort of of like liability for for uh, misinformation right mm -hmm. so what do you see your different uh platforms and brands doing right um this is at the same time when uh social media started to take a boom right and like people are you know follower counts are starting to mean something right so brands and media platforms start partnering or 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 reaching out to um your quote unquote influencers mm -hmm. right people who have a large following so that way they can um borrow that real estate thinking that you know if this person is regularly contributing to our site right um their audience will come with them right this is the moment when creators start getting empowered right because now you're being um you're not you're you're being approached as an individual business entity right and that is when you begin seeing people starting to, you know, create their own YouTube channels and people are, you know, obviously we didn't have all the functionalities on your on your Instagram and Twitter that we have now, but you're starting to see people develop a cult like following. Right. And that is when um, creators begin to be empowered. Right. They're, they're, brands are literally there is no middleman. Brands are literally reaching out and saying we will pay you X amount per month to post about us to contribute to our platform, whatever the content is, um, and to uh, essentially be uh, uh, a liaison between us and the target audience we're looking to reach, right? Now, the way that develops over time is people start getting smart and realizing, you know, back back then it was like, all right, well, if I'm, if I'm such and such and I'm a fashion influencer and Glamour Magazine wants to hire me as a, as a contributor, as a writer, I'm getting, um, they're borrowing cultural equity for me because the audience actually believes in me, not necessarily Glamour Mag, right? Um, and I'm borrowing um, equity from them because that is a, a, a legacy brand and a recognizable brand. So it, it puts a stamp on me, right? Because of association. But what starts to happen? People start to realize, actually, fuck the brand. We don't need them. I'm the one that people are coming to get the information from the people that want people want to see me and see me talk about these things mm. right so so i could just own i could eat the whole plate why the fuck would i why the fuck would i give my juice to glamour and they own the content they right. pay me they own everything i create and my audience is going over there right so that's when you start to see creators start to get more smart and say all right well you know i could just start my own magazine or my own uh platform or or you know i don't even have to have a website i can just my instagram can be my channel right and they start to smarten up even more right and say okay well all of my audience is on instagram instagram owns my audience you know what i'm saying if instagram crashed tomorrow i don't have 
I don't have any, any, any my audience is my value. I don't have any value if, if, if my page gets deleted or Instagram shuts down or whatever, right? So how do I own my content, own my audience, right? Because that's actually the real currency, right? When the attention economy, right? So people eyeballs on my shit is, is the value. So that's when you see people starting to develop newsletters and things like that to turn their audience into subscribers that they can own, that they can directly sell to. And then what do you have? You have your direct to consumer market uh, emerge, right? Where I can just sell my knowledge or my product, my pro product, whatever it is, your product can be an actual like physical product or it can be knowledge or whatever. I can package it and sell it directly to my consumer who at this point, they've been watching me grow for the past however many years they're invested, right? I can sell directly to them. I don't have to, uh, there doesn't have to be a middleman, right? I don't have to partner with Nike to sell athleisure. I can just sell it right to you, right? So that's how the evolution of the creator economy started, right? And now we're in this space where, um, you know, hard product is easy to sell. Intellectual property is what people are trying to get a hold of now, right? Because once you put an idea out in the ether, I mean, you can say it's yours, but once it's out there, it's all of ours. You know what I mean? And that's the that's the hill everybody's trying to climb over now. That's that's man, that's some phenomenal context and, and, and backstory just for people to really understand that evolution mm -hmm. of, of how, how we got here. And so my follow-up question to that would be there, there's this there's this sentiment that creatives are not necessarily the best business people, right? Like they have the creative juice for sure. Like they have the sauce, if you will. But when it comes to understanding what it looks like to really be that business entity or create something that's sustainable, they don't necessarily understand that. So for them, sometimes it's more attractive and easier to just be like, yeah, let me get this brand deal. I got their support, got their infrastructure. Let me just do what I do best. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe they're probably shooting themselves in the foot notably, right. As you just articulated. Um, but to that, like, what are you, I guess it's a twofold question. Like, is that true from your vantage point, right? Number one, is that just a, is that just an arbitrary assumption? And then I guess two is what can creatives do to better prepare themselves to be able to be in position for these opportunities? Because my only my only concern or thought is it's like, man, you like you say, you grow this influence, right? You have hundred thousand followers on IG or you have, you know, whatever it is, this big, you know, this big audience. But if you don't know how to monetize, we see it all the time. People have huge audiences. But they don't know how to mind. There's people who have way more followers than me, but I know they ain't got as much money as me. I just, I, you know what I'm saying? I just know. So it's like, it's because I have, I have a business acumen, right? right? And so my question is for creative listening to this, it's like, that sounds good and I get it, but I just don't, I wouldn't even know how to position myself to the brand. If a brand says, hey, look, this is what we want you to do. All they know how to do is say yes to the check. They don't know what their, what their worth is. They yeah. don't have maybe an infrastructure set up to leverage it. Uh, yeah. Just what are your thoughts on helping creators reframe how they think about it? Obviously, a lot of people have started to figure it out, but I feel like there's still a huge amount of people who mm -hmm. just don't know, right, from an infrastructure standpoint. Yeah, I mean, so I think number one is for every creator to understand that um, they, are, they are a business, right? Now, it's your choice whether or not you want to uh, participate in that, right? Because I, I also believe that... Um, before I get dig too deep into this, I, I, I think it's important to say that I think that um, because of the creator economy that's emerged, it's created this narrative that if you are a creative, you should be selling whatever it is you're making. And that's not necessarily true. It's totally fine for you to just paint. And that's it. You know what I'm saying? Um, cash cash making, drop on that. You know what right. I'm saying? <laughs> like that, that's, once you start making your art your business, it is going to, it is not going to feel the same anymore. Facts. That's a fact. And Thanks. people can try to romanticize that as much as they can. I mean, I wish I could go back to the days when I was just fucking writing articles just for the, just, just cause I wanted to get my, my shit off. And that was it. As soon as the check started coming with it, it became a job. So I just want to say that. Um, I think that's important to say, cause it's easy for that to get glossed over. Now, uh, with respect to how creators can see themselves as a business and how to enter certain conversations. Um, just always remember that you're the one being approached, right? That's number one, right? You're being courted. So the value is already there. Even if you don't see it, it's already there, right? Now, next, next point is to always ask questions, right? 
just look at it bare bones, just like you're just like if you were going shopping, right? Like everybody, everybody and their mama has has tried to haggle a price before. It's the same thing. You ask questions, right? So if a brand is reaching out to you to work with you, it's really important to understand, all right, so what are your goals? Not the overview of the brand campaign. What are the metrics, right? What are the metrics that you're, that is called key performance indicators? Yeah. What are the key performance indicators that you're measuring success by for this program or campaign that you're reaching out for me to be a part of, right? Because once you understand the key performance metrics, now you pull the curtain back, you understand? Now you can, now you understand why they're reaching out to you and you can hype up the value in whichever direction you want to point it in, right? So most of the time, one of those key performance indicator, indicators is going to be uh, brand awareness, right? Okay, so the next logical question after that is, all right, so after you, you, after you get this brand awareness, what is it that you're trying to do with the awareness, right? What's the conversion point, right? You need to find out where the dollar, where these brands are assigning the dollar value of the transaction they're having. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Once you're able to do that, then you can you can measure your value, right? So I would say like, if I was an influencer, right? And somebody reached out to me and was to say, all right, well, we're reaching out to you because you know how to create content and you know how to uh, contextualize certain information. And we want you to be able to, to communicate our brand campaign to your audience in a way that maybe we can't do it right okay cool that's great so what it sounds like is you want communication strategy right now we're talking about a whole different bag you know what i mean you're not reaching out to me just to post something you're I, you're at you're reaching out to me to translate something mm, right that's a bar so so it's important to always find a way to relate what they're reaching out to you for to an actual job function because when you can relate it to an actual job function, what can you do? You can look at what the uh, actual salary range is for that job, right? Now, let's just say the average, on the average, I think the market for, uh, uh, I don't know, um, uh, content strategies is like, depending on where you ask, like 150K or something like that, right? So you divide that by by 12, divide that over, over a span of months. How long is this pa campaign gonna last? Because if you're going to be having to do this work, then you should be charging that retainer fee per month. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That's the formula, y'all. That's how you yeah. do the formula. So, so once you once you do that, you can land on a number that's actually competitive. Now, don't get me twisted. Like influencers can get a hell of a bag, uh, and I don't want to just say influencers. I want to say creators, right? Because I actually hate that word, influencer. Um, <laughs> it's too loosely dished out. But that's all. Influencer. <laughs> It's, yeah. it's, you look at the market for what people are charging to be, to, to, to be a quote unquote, uh, uh, influencer for, for whatever, mm -hmm. and just make sure your numbers are competitive with that market. But you should also be looking at like the work you have to do. And we can use what we've done for an example, uh, George, with, with the T-Mobile thing, right? You didn't just, we didn't just hit you up to post nothing. You had to do some work. You had to write. You know what I mean? You have to put together a presentation. You're going to have to present that presentation. Now we're talking about things that, that are more than, than your access to an audience. Now we're talking about this, you know what I'm saying? So you have to charge effectively for that. And I think there was a second question and I, and I just want to make sure I answered it. Um, I think yeah. go ahead, Jacqueline. I would say, I, I think you, you got a lot of it. Well, I'll let you ask that second question, George. I think there's two things that I extracted from what you just said that really stuck out to me. And I think that's for creators to know that, um, not even just creators, everybody should know that everything in life is a negotiation. Yeah. So even when you walk into Walmart and you you know, go into Target and you decide to buy something, that's still a negotiation. Now, of course they have their set prices, but it is. And so when you're working with these brands, remember that, like you said, you are negotiating your price and you have to figure out what your value is. And you gave a really good formula for that. But I know a lot of people, especially people who are just getting started in their craft or, you know, just getting started doing something, getting started with the business. 
a lot of times we question our value and we're like, oh, I know, you know, a lot of people are charging six figures for that, but I'm just getting started. So maybe I'm worth 50,000. And I think you brought up a good point in saying that your value is there. You know, if somebody is reaching out to you or, or people have pointed it out to you for sure, like the value is there. So of course you need to match your confidence with the value, but I think that it's there. So I think that that was a really good uh, point. That was a bar for me. And I, and I also think that like, you know, on that point of negotiation, if anybody reaches out to you, they're expecting you to counter offer. Oh yeah. That's part of the game. Like anybody who reaches out to you and is, is thinking that you're just going to say yes right away is stupid. You know what I'm saying? Like they're expecting you to counter offer. That's just, it's just like if you were going for a job interview and they offer you the job, you counter yeah. offer. They yeah. got money. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you going to ask for it. And like, I would say like, you don't always have to counter offer with more money. Maybe they're like, hey, we want eight posts for 10 racks. Mm -hmm. And you're like, mm, you know, if 10 racks is where you guys are at, how about I give you four posts for 10 racks instead of eight? Like you can right. always negotiate other things aside from just the dollar value. Right, hundred percent. And you can also, that leads to, that leads into other incentives. Like what, maximize what this brand or this platform or this company is going to do for you. Can they give you product that you can leverage? You know what I mean? Um, can they, can they promote you in a way that makes more sense for a long-term goal you have? Like always, always having your back pocket, what you need next, not what you need right now, what you need next, because you can leverage a situation to put you in position to, uh, to eat better down the line versus, versus the short term. Yeah, because here's where, here's where my goes. Here, here's where my mind goes with that, right? Because I I look at almost everything as an investment, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, when I whenever I'm making an investment, I have criteria that determine when I get into the investment, why I make the investment in the first place, and when I exit the investment, right? I have that criteria, and what that does is it it, it takes the emotion out of it, and it makes my decision around the investment very objective, right? If it meets this criteria, it's a good play, right? right. And so when you're a creative or an entrepreneur or whatever you consider yourself, what you got to do is you got to go into these conversations or these potential opportunities with the same logic. It's like, okay, I know my worth, right? I'm the investment in that scenario, right? And it's like, okay, cool. When, when would it make sense for me to entertain this, right? right? What is the play here? Because you cannot lose what you don't have. Mm -hmm. And when you go into these discussions or go into the opportunities, like, oh my gosh, like somebody reached out to me, like, I got, I, I got to make it work. Like, no, like the reason why I can confidently you know, be in a discussion and, you know, kind of be able to walk away if it doesn't make sense is because I don't have it yet. I, I'm not attached to anything until it hits my bank account. At that point, it's That's mine. That's the key. That's the key. Always be, be, always be able to get up and walk away from the table. Always yeah. be willing to walk away. Because if you, if you, that is the power. If you're willing to get up and walk, because there's somebody working at these places that better secure these damn, uh, con these damn partnerships with whoever, right? Mm -hmm. And they, and like I said, especially depends on the, the, the size of the company we're talking about. They got what you need. Mm -hmm. It ain't a question of whether or not they got what you need. It's whether or not you're going to ask for it and or position it in a way that makes sense. They got it. Yeah. They have it. Hey, Jacqueline, <laughs> a mental note. Remind me to uh, loop us all in on Pocket Advisor Enterprise Partnerships. I think there's a, there's a play there. But I think that that's a... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll Definitely. definitely do that. But this is a yeah. this is a good chance to uh, highlight our big money energy moment. So, Dev, uh, you haven't been a part of this yet, but feel free to join in. So our big money energy moment is just where we like to pause and highlight something that is going well financially in the culture. So uh, this past week, Goldman Sachs stated that they are to invest 10 billion over a decade to support black women. Mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs group said on uh, past Wednesday that it will invest 10 billion in an initiative to support black women over the next 10 years, focusing on areas including healthcare, job creation and education. The bank's 1 million black women initiative is a part of its commitment to impact the lives of at least 1 million black women by 2030. I think that this was uh, subject to a BME moment because it's amazing to see these large brands speaking out and saying, hey, you know, we are supporting 
black women we are supporting the culture so i'm happy to see it i know goldman sachs has been moving their business model in towards helping people who do not meet the ultra high net worth class so i love to see it what do you guys think about this dev any comments uh, I mean, it's great. I, I think uh, I love to see, you know, like you said, these different um, entities um, mobilizing some dollars that can create some long term uh, impact and change. Um, I'm always interested and I haven't had a chance to really do my homework on on. I've seen the headlines. I'm always right. interested in seeing like, how, you know, how the money is being distributed. Right absolutely who's involved in in like or how 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 transparent is the process right like what what how is this actually being mobilized right after the big announcement that's what that's what i think brands need to uh that's where they need to do their most homework right cutting the check is easy right it's it's mobilizing the dollars in a way that actually makes sense that so many times we see these companies cut a check we don't know where the money went mm -hmm. we don't know who it impacted we don't know how mm -hmm. far it stretched. We just know that they cut a check. It's great PR news. And I'm not saying that's the case here with Go right, right. I'm, not, I'm not trying to be a, a downer, right? But that's always my um that's always where my perspective is at is okay, how are you mobilizing these dollars? Um and I think I feel like we had to get over the hump of brands like taking some accountability and saying, like, all right, shit is wrong out here, right? And if you're going to be making money off of any community you should be redistributing those dollars in that community because it ultimately helps your long-term goal. If people are economically incentivized and, um, and right. amplified and improved, they have more money to spend with you. And right. if they know that you were, the, were part of the solution and helping them have more money, they have less of a problem spending it back with you. It's all, it goes back to what I said earlier. It's all about a relationship. We all know what we're here for. Right. You, know you just got to be really stupid and racist to not make that connection. Right. Because you like you, you really just simplified and distilled it down. Even even if it's for your bottom line, it is smarter to put the consumers in a position to where they can spend more money with you. Right. Like it's just it's really that simple. And I don't think I've ever heard anybody articulated that 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 plainly, but it really is that simple. It is literally in your interest. Yeah, you already fighting tooth and nail to spend what they can with you, even with, even with your, your lack of support or whatever, right. if you put them in an empowered economic position and, and on top of that, they know that they, they really gonna spend the bag, which is so simple. Like, even if you don't care anything about the culture, right? Like it's smart for you to do that. It's, it's a, it's, <laughs> it really is like, it, it's, it's, it's that simple, but, but a lot of times what I have to tell people is right. Um, I think I always find it interesting how much, and I'm speaking specifically about black culture right now. I always find it interesting how much people, you know, like we know how valuable black culture is, right? Yeah. We, know that. we know we set trends. We know that we make shit cool. We know that just as quick as we say a product is hot, that product goes, you know what I'm saying? Like we can talk about a 10 million different brands that's, that's happened with, right? Bir Birkin bags. Right, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Which, and I also want people to be clear, they was getting bread anyway right like like I, I feel like sometimes and somebody gonna be in my comments when i repost this and they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna come for me and that's cool because i'm gonna light that ass up but um <laughs> i think that sometimes we we uh we over what's what i'm looking for it's not overcompensate i think that we over um we, 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 we overestimate the value that we bring to a company, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have a $1 trillion buying power, right? Sure. So we're spreading that across all these different industries and verticals, right? But let's, but, but we also have to remember that it doesn't mean that these companies flop without us. They just have more money. They're just getting more revenue. They're not getting the only revenue from us, right? So when we talk about culture, right? And we, we talk to we talk about these brands as if they're people. We want them to care about why the black community is so important. These brands are inanimate objects. They are buildings with logos with people in them who have to do what they have to do to get paid their salary. Nike's not a person. Adidas is not a person. Uh, the NBA is not a person. Right. It's a collection of people, right? So when we start talking about, all right, 
we want these, these companies and brands to do right by the culture, we have to talk about the bottom line, the business, right? How can doing right by the culture uh, result in more revenue for your brand? Because these brands don't give a fuck about doing right by people because the brand isn't a person. It's a, mm. a revenue mechanism, right? And that's what I want, where I want our conversation to change, right? Um, because yes, we're valuable as people. We the shit, you know what I'm saying? We all black here. We know we the shit. I wouldn't want to be nothing else. I wake up and love this shit every day. I couldn't imagine that not being black. This shit is lit. You know what I'm saying? It is. You know what I'm saying? But um, we got to talk money. We got to talk dollars. You know what I'm saying? And I and the reason that I'm harping on this is because I've had so many people reach out to me and be like, yo, how do I pitch to this company or pitch to this brand and do this, that, and the third? And, you know, and they keep saying culture, 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 and I do this with the culture and da, 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 da. And I, and I want so bad to say, they don't give a fuck about no culture. They don't. They don't. You need to find opportunity gaps that you can fill using the culture. Where are the opportunity gaps in these companies? What, what are they missing, right? That a project that you have in mind uh, can fill that gap and therefore is worthy of investment. And the, and the culture being empowered is the byproduct of that. Right. That's the byproduct. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we can keep using the T-Mobile example, right? What I identified was um, T-Mobile does not, did not, uh, T-Mobile for Business in particular did not have, uh, they were not a destination for anything. You're selling small business products, but you're not a destination, right? How are you not in the publishing game yet, right? That doesn't make any sense. Right, every brand is a publisher. Red Bull, fucking uh, Nike, fucking even Verizon has a blog. You know what I'm saying? Like, how are you not publishing content, right? How are you not making yourself a destination for small business owners to come and receive some sort of tangible knowledge mm -hmm. and therefore associate that knowledge with you and your product and have no problem converting to spending, right? Now, within that, of course, I want to do something for the culture, right? Of course, I want to put black people on, right? But me putting black, but black people being the conduits of this information has nothing to do with the fact that that platform should exist anyway. That's a value proposition, right? So I sell that in. Then we say, all right, well, we wanna do something with the black community. Obviously every brand with their head on straight wants to empower black the black community, right? All right, cool. But I'm gonna I'm a make sure you're grabbing the right people and working with the right people who have an intimate relationship with their consumer, who aren't cornballs, you know what I'm saying? Who aren't, you know what I'm saying, out here just taking a money grab and, and doing whack shit with it, right? That's how you empower the culture. Now, everybody wins. T-Mobile is, is a business that the people within it may want to do right by, the, by Black people, right? Because of the moment we're in, right? That's great. But at the end of the day, they had a business need that needed to get filled and it got filled off the back of that. We put money in the, in the hands of people who deserve it. You know what I'm saying? With more opportunity to come. That's how you do it. So I know I just went on a tangent just now, but no, I just made it though. No, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a huge, huge bar though. Cause it goes back to like, again, just being objective. It's like, look, culture is cool. Okay, great. But like, if I'm pitching, especially if I'm pitching this, one thing they pitch you, if I'm pitching them, like, let me identify this void, this gap right. that I can feel that ties to a tangible metric objectively. Right. Now, it could possibly benefit the culture, right? That's just, that, and that just comes from being strategic. It's like, okay, I'm a position, I'm going to show them what they want. I know ultimately it's going to feed into what I want or what I value, mm -hmm. but like, I got to give them what they want. I can't lead in with you should want to, everybody else is talking about black culture and supporting black culture and you should too. What the yeah. fuck does that have to do with anything? Right. Like, this is how doing this will increase your bottom line. Right. Right. It just so happens that you'll get, right. a, you'll get a nice PR bump because here's what I think is a great conduit, as you put it, to be able to disseminate this message. And, and, and there are also different, again, to go back to those KPIs, sometimes it's not always directly impacting the bottom line. There's such thing as brand affinity, brand engagement, things that uh, ultimately lead to leading customers or potential customers down a, 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 a sales funnel, right? but you need to have established brand trust and things like that, right? So if you can look at that, you know what I mean? And, and, and paint a picture around it. And not only that, if you succeed and do numbers, then you make that, then you have that conversation. You see what happens when you work with these people? 
You see what happens when you work with this culture? Look at this. We can talk about the percentages. You know what I'm saying? We can talk about the increases, right? This ain't no accident. You know what I mean? Have you seen numbers like this before? Have you seen this area of your business perform like this? Okay, well then it's safe to say that we can make a connection right here. Let's reinvest some more money. Let's let's put some let's hire some more people to do this shit over again. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I'm say that it reminds me of like like if you were like a star athlete, right? And it's like, okay, cool. Like we're gonna do this first, you know, your rookie contract, you know what I'm saying? And then when I go out here and kill shit, you best believe when I come back to the table to renegotiate, like yeah. we're gonna be gonna be talking, we're gonna be talking some numbers, right? That's, so that's it's also being willing to prove your it's like be, knowing that you are what you say you are. Right. And so that when you prove that, like you have leverage, right? But it's like like if, the reason why Costco is willing to give away those free samples is they know your ass gonna want to go buy buy it after you taste it. But if you don't have no confidence in yourself and your brand and what you're selling, say cool, we'll do it this way, right? This first go around, um, and this is how we gonna play it. But just know we come we coming back around. You know what I mean? Right. I think that's the key is really understanding your own value and knowing that if I give them a little sample, pause, um, they definitely gonna want to you know come back around. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah, there's always, there's always um, you got it. I think we all, we all, creators in general, right? But I know we're just we're talking about culture right now. We have to understand the way transactions work. Like nobody in their mom, nobody in their, nobody in their mom, nobody in their right mind is going to throw the bank at something that's, un, that's unproven, right? And nobody else is going to, nobody's going to throw the throw bank at, just because it was proven somewhere else doesn't mean that it, it reflects in, in the same way for, for their business or their platform. Mm -hmm. You gotta be able to have that conversation. And I see a lot of us have so much conversation and dialogue around just doing stuff with us. Like just, like in, like incubating the black community, right? And they try to relate it to- Isolating. Like, yeah, and they try to like relate it to like segregation and how that was a mistake and we should have stayed, you know, I get that, but like right now it's important for us to think globally. The, everything is global now. We can, I got home, I got, I got homies in, in, in other countries that I could talk to right now. I, all I gotta do is tweet. It's global. You can't do global business and not do business with everybody. You can't incubate. You know what I'm saying? We can, we can, we can trade and barter and make sure that we're amplifying each other and supporting each other, but we got to think on a global scale and to think on a global scale is, is about being, is about that, that word inclusive being exhibited by us just as much as we want it exhibited to us. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I think that's a mountain that we got to climb and justifiably so. Like, I don't think anybody's wrong for having that state of mind. I, I was like that for a long time too. You know what I mean? Like we got to, we got to do right by us right now because nobody else is trying to do it. Right. But we, yeah. we can't lose sight of if we, if, knowing we have a global impact, what sense does it make to not think globally? Right, right. That, that's that's shooting our, shooting ourselves in the foot, right? So it's almost like you know, hey, like, you know, we we just talked about how those brands by not working with us or shooting themselves in the foot, we would be, in turn be doing the same thing, right? Yeah. And it's just about strategy. It's like how can I know that my end game or part of my strategy is to amplify my people, like you said, barter, put people on. Yo, gee, I got this crazy thing with T-Mobile, boom, 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 right? Like in understanding that from a back end perspective. Yeah. but not shooting yourself on the front end uh, to be able to do business at a higher level. So now right. that is a conversation that needs to be. Yeah, made. I mean, we're being completely uncensored here. Like I am, I'm mixed. So my mom's white, my dad is black and Puerto Rican. So I've never wanted to live in this realm of like isolation. And um, although I love doing things for the culture, like I know because it's how I was brought up that like you have to have some form of diversification in pretty much everything you do. It was taught to me as a child through music. I was told you're not allowed to only listen to Tupac. You're going to listen to other things too. Yeah. And <laughs> I was able to translate that like to the rest of my life into business. So Dev, what's your opinion on people who have created a business that's specifically for the culture? What would your recommendation be to expanding that? Because as you said, we have global reach and we have the opportunity for global impact. So how would you recommend somebody expands beyond just being for the culture? I think that, I think that it's about, uh, when we talk about expansion, it's just in terms of like different markets you can crack. 
and different partners you can have, right? You can still have the same um, target audience and you, your product, whatever it may be, can still be geared towards that specific audience, right? But nine times out of 10, the information and or the product is also useful for other markets, right? Like, again, George, I'm just gonna keep using this example. If we look at what we've done for T-Mobile, right? You're presenting something that is about um, business credit, right? And within there, within that, there are intricacies that are, that are, are, are strictly relevant to black people and people of color when it comes to, you know, uh, overcoming any biases and accessing that credit and things like that, right? But the credit game is the same, don't matter if you red, purple, blue, whatever the fuck, right? That information is still valuable and sellable in a million different markets, in a million different ways, right? Now there's nuances to it that are specific to the culture, right? And that's how you, you expand is to say, all right, well, these nuances are are specific to us, right? Now, what are those nuances for Latinx? Are there nuances for LGBTQ community? Are there nuances for um, uh, for, for women, right? Like there are other markets you can serve. You don't have to cap yourself. You know what I'm saying? Now, now if your priority is is within a certain culture, cool. There's nothing wrong with that. You can do 80-20, you know what I'm saying? If you so choose, I'm not saying you have to, you know what I'm saying? If you so choose to do 100%, you're focused on this one market, go for it. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I just think that it's, um, we should always be, have our eyes open and our head on the swivel to consider how we can make the same effort work for us in six different ways. Six. You know what I'm not necessarily exactly six, but I'm just okay. Saying, All right. I'm saying, <laughs> no, I'm more more ways than one. Nah, for we sure. know you're the we know you're the guru, so I'm just making sure I'm not missing with the six. But oh, gave uh, us the formula, you know what I'm saying? Like, that, was, <laughs> that was a quick little bar, you know what I'm saying? Just, <laughs> it was for sure. And like I think the best way that I can like understand a visual of what you were saying was I went to buy new um, sleeping caps, and I was like, hmm, let me see what's on Amazon. So pop on Amazon, like women's sleeping cap or whatever. And the one that I ended up purchasing, actually, when I looked through the pictures of it, it had pictures of like mostly black women, right? Because that's who you would anticipate really getting a sleeping cap. And then it had pictures of white women too. And I was like, hmm, this is interesting. I was like, do white women wear sleeping caps? But to your point of like a brand, maybe the brand is really positioned for black people because that was most of their models. They also are able to expand by showing like, hey, it's actually other women who wear our sleeping caps too. So I feel like that's the best representation that I can get of what you're saying. Yeah, and uh, you would you would probably, you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't be surprised if like, I feel like I've seen screenshots of that and like people would get mad and be like, this product's for black women. Duh, 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 duh. And it's like, yeah, it is totally, 100%. As long as it's available to you. It'd be one thing if they were just making it and, and, and like trying to sell it to white women, knowing that black women are really who need this product. Now we got a problem. All right, well, what the fuck? You know what I'm saying? Like, are you kidding? You know what I'm saying? Now you're just being negligent as a brand, right? Yeah. You should serve this market because that actually is a need for us, right? Yeah. Now, if this brand so happens to say, all right, well, yeah, this is pretty useful. And brands do, let me tell you something. People need to understand that brands don't just put shit out. It, there's millions of dollars put into product development and stuff. So brands ain't just saying, all right, well, cool. We're going to go sell it over here. No, they're doing surveys and shit. You know what I'm saying? Like brand studies. They're doing homework to, to cause somebody has to validate that there is a, a, a market share to take for this product mm -hmm. before we go into marketing and product development and selling of this product. And we don't know if the, if this other market's going to buy it. That's not how this shit works. So yeah. none of this shit's an accident. You know what I'm saying? If it's being sold elsewhere, it's because there was some sort of homework done that says, all right, well, this makes sense. The profit margins are, are, are within our favor. Let's go ahead and do that. And that's, that's a lesson, and that's a lesson to small business owners too. Obviously you're not right. gonna be on the scale of, of uh, you know, a Fortune 500 company, but it's like, don't just be crazy. I mean, say this with, kind, with, with the proper context. I mean, yes, create to create, <laughs> if that's what you want to do right if you're not necessarily tying into a business cool like you just you just want to drop some shit. i do that all the time with my tweets and stuff right like I, there's nothing i want from that just like hey here's a here's a bar for you 
But like if you're actually putting some thought and effort into a business or something that you want to sell, mm -hmm. like within the realm of your capacity and resources, do some research, right? Validate yeah. a thesis. Like everything that just pops into your head isn't necessarily the next great business idea. Right. You know I mean? Ask some questions. Go to your target market, right? Because then you can't get mad or get frustrated when shit ain't moving off the shelf. It's like, right. did you confirm that this is that people even wanted this, or did you just wake up one day and be like, yo, I think this would be dope? Says yeah. who? You know yeah. what I mean? If you think it'd be dope and you want to create it just to create it for yourself, by all means do it. Mm -hmm. Right. But you know, speaking about small business owners, that is probably the lowest barrier to entry, right? If you truly believe in something that you think you want to sell, mm -hmm. yeah, create, create it for yourself. Give a few to your homies. They might have a little bit of influence. Hey, just throw this on or whatever it is. Use this. Let me know what you think. Right. And then that might be the easiest way, but don't just go into something without any effort yeah. and determining if, if, if a, there's a market for it. Right. And then to go back to your other point about like um, the nuance or just being able to tap into other markets, like I have an e-commerce brand, you know, called Melanin Money. Right. But here's a kicker. As of this, as of last year, on the site we sell, we now sell stuff that you don't necessarily have to be black to want to wear, right? And so it's like, okay, we ran the play on the all black thing. The brand, even as a name, technically caters to all black. But I've had white people buy certain stuff, like for example, sleeping bag society. Yeah, you don't gotta be black. You don't gotta be black to rock that. And so it's like, do I want to shoot myself in the foot by saying, hey, I don't only want black people on my site? No, anybody who's willing to go go to that website and hit checkout, you're more than welcome. I think uh, that's like that's that's yeah, like yeah, yeah. when you see people like I was at, like the Jay-Z news came out, right? That you know, he's selling title and all this other stuff. And I saw so many people get pissed. Like, uh, oh well, you know, there's no black owned streaming services anymore, and this, that, and the third. And I'm like I'm like, okay. In what world was title ever gonna compete? with Apple Music and Spotify. Right. How? Right. How? The bankroll's not there. You know what I'm saying? And you have to look at the long-term vision of what someone's doing, right? And this is kind of off the cuff, right? But it's just like, you know, you got to look at, at whether or not something makes sense business-wise, right? And what is better? title being owned by being primarily owned by a black person, right? Or title being owned by a, by Square, which is actually a financial financial institution, right? Where inevitably, I mean, we don't, I don't know what the plan is, but like yeah, if, yeah. if title offers the most money per stream, right? An independent artist can win the most by using title and title is 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 linked with a financial institution and all independent artists are in, a, 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 essentially their own independent business right don't you think there's a, a a value proposition there that the other streaming services can't give you apple can give you the bag right mm -hmm. spotify can run your run your streams up right cuz they're in bed with all the all the um all the uh the 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 music labels right um and podcasting they own that that world right 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 but what platform is there streaming wise that can not only pay artists more but there seems to be some synergy in terms of like actually creating a business and financial structure that while, while all this stuff is going on with cryptocurrency and all this shit that's happening like mm -hmm. there's something there that is yeah. a unique value proposition. What's more important, it being owned by Jay Z, or or it being a platform that financially uh, empowers independent artists, right? Of uh, and if you black, great, you eat too. You know what I'm saying? And 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 I know like I'm I'm uh, part of that is me assuming, right? I don't know what the new business model is, right? But I'm just right. I'm just adding and subtracting from what I have in front of me, right? that makes more sense. And then you look at the long-term, I don't know, I was watching that whole shit with Jay-Z. I was like, this motherfucker is a beast. I think he's gonna try well, to buy right. You know I think he's gonna do? I'll go on record saying this. Here's what I think he's gonna do. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let me say it first. Let me say it first. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. I think, I think he's gonna buy Rock Nation. Hmm. 
Okay, that's reason strong. I, reason I say that is because I looked it up. Rock Nation and Rock Sports have a market value of like $214 million, right? He sold Ace of Spades, half of Ace of Spades for 300 million cash. Mm -hmm. Sold half a title or a majority stake in title for two, I don't know, 240 something mm -hmm. in like equity and cash, right? So now he has the cash on hand mm -hmm. to buy his whole record label. Mm -hmm. Now what's more important? Like, you know what I mean? Like Columbia Records and all these other record companies are owned by white people in these like conglomerates and they all work together and shit like mm -hmm. that. Now what's more important for an actual record label and management company to be black owned and in favor of artist independence. Mm -hmm. And then there's also an arm that is a fucking streaming company that is backed by a financial institution. I don't know, man. The whole shit kind of makes that's my theory. Now your 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 thesis is is a lot more elaborate and probably accurate than mine, right? So here, <laughs> here, here, here's mine. Mine's a little more straight to the point, right? So I went back when Jay uh, you know, whatever whatever deal or relationship he got with the NFL and everybody was like, ah, oh, Jay's a sellout. This is back when the people still weren't rocking with the NFL. Maybe people still aren't rocking with the NFL. I don't know, right? He got the relationship with the NFL, right? And now he's the, now he's kind of in that ecosystem. Now he made he liquidated, you know, these two major plays to put some more cash on his balance sheet. Not to mention the cash he already had on his balance sheet, right? I think he's going to make a play for a majority owner in the NFL team. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. I don't think but so. Think, you don't think so? Nah, them white folks ain't letting him in there. You don't think so? Okay. Uh, yeah. it we'll see. It's funny you said that because you know Master P just came out and said he wants to have an HBCU. And when he explained it, he was like, yeah, I used to want to have an NFL team, but he's like, now nah, I really want to have an HBCU because I think that it will be more impactful. So yeah, it's just kind of funny that you bring that up. I mean, just the way that Jay's been able to move. I, I know what you're saying about like them not letting him in, but man, the way you can't, you can't deny the way he's been able to move. You just never know. Oh yeah, 100%, 100% but I don't think... Uh... I mean, we'll see, man. We'll I ain't gonna say I ain't gonna say what he can't do. I ain't yeah, gonna. Yeah. Say that. I, I, again, I like your logic and your thesis for sure, um, but we'll see. I mean, he makes so many moves that it's almost like when I'm not sure if you watch Power, but like when they like were trying to predict like who killed Ghost and everybody on YouTube were doing their whole little like yeah, right. analysis and theory. Like, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, like there's so many different ways it could go. Yeah. It'll be interested, this interesting to see how it unfolds uh, one way or the other. Yeah. But uh, nonetheless, it was a power move. And we know that it, these these were just uh, stepping stones for a bigger play. We do know that. We're aligned yeah, there. But these were stepping like stones that. for a bigger play. Right? Yeah, you're doing something. I need some of that shit. Jay, <laughs> well, well, in conclusion, is there any last nuggets or tips that you want to share with our listeners? Um... I mean, you dropped a lot of bars today, so I can see you, you may be out. You may yeah, be shout out. Down, drop, drop a few flex bombs throughout this podcast. Our podcast editor, yo, drop a few flex bombs. <laughs> pew, pew, pew. Um, I would say that I don't know if it's a Jew. I did want to get a chance to talk about uh, just the media landscape. Yeah, I saw, that's what I was going to ask. I did want like, where are we going? We talked about where we've been, yeah. how we got here. But like, go ahead and put your predictions on record. Like. You know, the, with the media, current media landscape and kind of where we're going. I would love to. Love to um, I just think like uh, the value in contextualized media is inevitably going up. And what I mean by contextualized media is um, audiences are getting pumped with so much information, right? That content is not king anymore, right? Mm -hmm. uh, context is king and conversation is queen. And what I mean by that is um, there's more value in platforms that scale back on uh, the amount of information they produce or the amount of content they produce and share and over index on um, the quality of information within that content, right? Um, it's almost like look at it like a sneaker drop, right? Like you know, Nike drops or whatever. I don't know none of these damn sneakers, to be honest with you, but you know what I'm saying? You you know, Nike or I don't know, Yeezy does a sneaker drop every, you know, X, whatever, and people are lined up outside the store, right? Um, because they want that sneaker, right? They want that product. I think it's the same way for content. 
Um, whenever, whenever you're looking for a trend in a new direction, just look at what's happening now and where the problems are in it. And anybody who's, there's somebody somewhere, some people, some places rather that are thinking like, all right, well, now it needs to be this way because everybody's sick of this shit. And we're all sick of being pumped with so much information. And I have a theory just like on how that looks in terms of like the, just the media marketing landscape. I think that right now we're all pumped with so much information and what happens. We don't have proper context. We don't have contextual and we don't really know why we're reacting to shit the way we're reacting to it because we're just, we're, it's headline reactions, right? We're not getting, like if there's breaking news every fucking day, there's no way like the real information is coming out weeks after. By then we've already moved on, right? So we're, so as consumers, we're, we're generating behaviors based off of limited to no information, right? So we're generating those behaviors and then what happens? Brands, they do their campaigns, they do their marketing, they do their product development based off of consumer studies. So what happens when the study results are based off of behaviors that are ill-informed, right? And that's where you have a lot of brands, you know, missing the mark on connecting with their consumers. So it's a cycle of, of, of um, it's, a, it's a cycle, it's a cycle powered by misinformation, right? So what I think is next is that media, pla and, 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 and what's interesting is a lot of these platforms are stuck in this ad revenue model. So they have to keep pumping shit out just to keep their doors open, right? So I don't know how a new revenue model takes shape, but I do think that that's what's next is how can, you know, and you see it in small doses like Mass Appeal. Mass Appeal got rid of their whole editorial platform, right? All the articles and shit they had, they stopped that shit. And what they start doing, documentaries in partnership with Netflix and like shit like that, where they could do like segmented content um, on regular intervals that cost them less money. Um, but um, they generate more uh, brand awareness that way, right? So I think that what's going to happen is media platforms are going to start taking that, that uh, trying to figure out a way to not have to depend on traffic for revenue. And they're already doing it, right? That's why you see so many strategic partnerships and so-and-so links with such and such to come up with a capsule and release it at a limited run or whatever, right? Um, I think that's what's next. And that's what, that's, that's the, that's the part of the game that I'm trying to get in on now is like, all right, how do I create a platform that is that, right? Um, because I think people are thirsty for information, but they wanna know the whole, they wanna know as much as possible. They know people are skeptical about what we receive because we know that it can't all be, we can't, it can't, we can't be receiving all the information. Right. right? So I think, I think that's what's next. And I think in terms of like how brands measure success, again, the consumer is right now, or the consumer knows what's up now. You can buy followers, you can buy views, mm -hmm. right? You can even pay for impressions, right? What's the last frontier of engagement that you can't buy? The last two. Conversation and time spent. You can't pay massive amounts of people to have dialogue with and about your brand. You can't pay massive amounts of people to spend time with your brand. It's great that you had 50,000 views on that YouTube video. How long was the average view duration? Because what the fuck does it matter if you have 50,000 views and people are staying for 30 seconds? That yeah. content is shit, right? Yeah. So I think that's the, that's the next frontier is like brands mastering how to like facilitate and maintain dialogue and time spent with their, uh, with their content marketing and their product. You know how I would sum all that up in a very quick sentence is like, quality always wins. Yeah, hell yeah. Like quality always wins. And so it's like, you know, even if you think about like trendy songs and, and music, it's like, okay, yeah, they capitalize on like a, a certain tone or whatever in the moment, but like we, we there's but there's also songs that we've been singing for 30 years. You yeah. know what I mean? And so it's like just understanding that, like if you're if you're really in it for the long game, you know what I'm saying? Understanding that quality always wins, right? There's some people say, I, I don't post over minute videos because people have short attention spans, but then they listen to a, a Joe Rogan episode that's like an hour and a half. Hour and a half, <laughs> right. And so it's, right. Just, it's just like reminding yourself of that. If it's good enough, 
Mm-hmm. I will win. Period. Right. If it's good enough, I will. Doesn't matter how long it is. Doesn't matter how attention spans. Like all that stuff is 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 relative. Makes sense to talk about, right? Mm-hmm. But like at the end of the day, it's like if it's good, you'll win. Period. Yeah. If you go to a restaurant. If it's good enough, you're gonna wait in line. You know what I'm saying? That is the that is the example I always use. Is it is the like you can. It is the job of marketing to get people to the door, right? But you can't make them go in and buy the cheeseburger. You know what I'm saying? That's a personal decision, right? Mm-hmm. And that comes down to the quality. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Have you ever been to, look at Chick-fil-A. When have you not, when have you gone to Chick-fil-A and the fucking line is not wrapped around the building? Right. But people are gonna wait in that motherfucker. Right. And, and, and it goes back to your point about conversation, right? And conversation in this sense is is reviews, right? Because it's quality, right? And so it's like, oh, the marketing got them to the door. Then they went in like, oh, this shit's fire. And we're going to talk about it because it's fire. Right. And then that's what keep, keeps people there. So, like, it's just all full circle. And, but if you just break it down, like, don't try to don't try to circumvent the process of being the fucking best. It's more right. like, just don't try to circumvent it. Because if you get that right... Everything else is subjective, right? There's there's hole in the wall restaurants that don't look good, right? If it was a vibe, it might get people to stay there even longer, but yeah. don't look that great. But because the food is fire, yeah. people keep coming back. So don't circumvent greatness is I guess how I would sum it up. Yeah, you can't cheapen it up, man. You gotta everything's been so microwave for so long that everybody forgot that sometimes you gotta put some shit in the oven, let that bitch bake. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It, it, there's a million fast food restaurants all over the place. Chick Fil A is good as fuck, but I'll wait an hour or two for my grandma to finish making that pot roast. I'm cool with that. That sh- that shit hit different. Right. Same thing with product and marketing. Do do dope shit. Create quality products, and, and at the end of the day, you'll win. Like there might be trends that you know, or waves that you might not be able to seemingly compete with in the moment. But it all comes back around. It all comes back around, you know? And that's what it boils down to. 100%. Yeah, so our fix your financial shit, ding, ding, ding. Donald, we got a little little noise for that. Um, so our fix your financial shit is like, hey, if you are a creator or you are you influencer, what are you doing to create quality content? We're urging you to create quality content. We have Dev here, and he's saying, if you want to win in the long run, we need quality. You need quality, and you need quality. If you quality can, and conversation. I'm telling you, if you can show up to the door and say, people are having dialogue and spending time with my shit, your value is through the roof. I am, I am telling you. That's people stopping to shop with you. Yeah. You yeah, that I mean? that makes sense. And like it's one like Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say one really quickly, like one way that I've noticed that is I heard somebody in marketing talking about like, hey, if Instagram allows you to put up to 10 photos in a post, put up to 10 photos in a post because that's more people that are staying longer for what you have to like provide value of. And the more swipes that they're looking at, the more engaged they are with you. So, I mean, to your point, they got to be quality. Depending on what you're doing, depending on what you're doing. Because I like to say all the time with uh, with content, there's ma- I, you always have to think about things in terms of macro and micro, in terms mm-hmm. of audience and in terms of uh, content, right? Your macro audience is, I'll, I'm going to make this really quick because I know, I know I think we're trying to wrap up, right? But uh so I will. We got our Joe Rogan shit. It's quality. We can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I need that Joe Rogan bag. They paid that motherfucker. Um, yeah, yeah. So you think about macro and micro. Mm. I will use Red Bull for an example, right? Red Bull is about extreme sports athletes, right? That is an overall culture. Regardless of the sport, there are certain cultural norms and values that that apply to all extreme sports athletes, right? Now you go in there in the micro level. Right. If you go on their website, they have channels, right? Where there's there's a, there's skateboarders, then there's uh surfers, and then there's uh fucking rock climbers and shit like that, right? Mm-hmm. All of those are micro cultures within the overall macro culture of extreme sports, and they have distinct um habits and values and behaviors that are related to their uh their uh specific sport, right? And you always have to be able to speak on a macro and micro level. 
Now, where that relates to content is your macro is typically your website or wherever your long form content exists, right? Your micro is your social media channels. You got half a second to catch people's attention, right? So how are you taking the information on a macro that's provided at the macro level and giving micro doses of it that speak to those cultural needs, nuances, and behaviors of the people you're trying to reach? Your job with social media is to try to get people to go back to the macro and spend even more time. But what you need right now in the micro is micro engagement, right? So when you say like, okay, if you've got those 10, you know, carousel slides, right? Let's be honest. If I'm scrolling, look, the only person that's getting me to scroll through 10 slides is Rihanna, my name. That's it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You got half a second to catch me. What does the creative say on that graphic? What's the sound bite you chose for that promo for that video? Perfect. You got half a second to catch me. And you better, you better say something that's gonna make me react right? And will it make me share? Will it make me comment? Will it make me watch, click through to watch the whole video? Those are the three things you gotta, you gotta, uh, those are the metrics that matter. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And if you're, and if you're, if you're marketing and your content marketing, um, is done in a deliberate way, you can be successful on a micro level in a way that impacts your macro level. Your macro should work to inform your micro and your micro should work to kick back to your macro. And yeah. if you're not doing that, then you're over indexing somewhere. And you're spending money and time and resources in, uh, in, in a space that, um, that you may not be getting ROI on. You know what I mean? And it mm -hmm. takes time. It takes, I'm still trying to learn how to teach other people on my teams that I work with how to do this shit. Cause I always end up in a space where I got to go in and fucking write the copy and all that shit. Cause I just, I just know what needs to be said, how to say it. And I'm getting to a point in my career now where I'm like, all right, I need to be able to teach people how to do this shit or I'm going to be burning hours on shit that like I, I, I need to be strategizing big, big picture, not worrying about the the um, the um, the more meticulous stuff. That's besides the point. No, nah, that, that makes sense. Micro. That, that makes sense. And as we close it out, one of the things that, that, that all this really made me think about, especially on the content piece is really just thinking about it like a front end investment versus like a back end investment right so like when you create quality on the front end there's a lot of things you got to think about like dev said there's the macro there's the micro there's the context there's this there's that there's a lot of things you got to think about on the front end to do it right but if you do it right on the front end it will pay dividends on the back end right so it's like go ahead like go all in on creating that quality content knowing the metrics that you need to hit knowing the KPIs, knowing the objectives and doing that thought work versus just like randomly putting some shit up, right? Because if you do it and you do it well, like people are, the life cycle of that content is going to be so much longer, right? Which is going to yield a better investment. You could do a quick little thing, you know what I'm saying? Or we're out really thinking about how it ties back to the macro or whatever. But the problem is it ain't going to really live that much longer. You know what I'm saying? So that's what, that's where the value comes in going ahead and doing the work on the front end and front loading the investment because now you got a piece of content going back to like music that like man this thing is i'm getting paid royalties forever off of this right you create a crazy ass youtube video i'm getting like and i'm not saying that that doesn't necessarily have to be your choice of monetization but the concept is you know youtube is a search engine right so if i create something that's so valuable right this video i created seven years ago might still be getting getting me paid or if i create a book like jacqueline that's so valuable now I'm still getting paid for this book that I created five years ago. Right? That is another thing real quick. When you talk about where the future is going in terms of all these things with creators working with these different brands is, is, is residual income, right? If you are a creator that makes a video for a brand and they're going to, you know, they might, you know, they're going to make rat, ad revenue dollars off of that for however long you shouldn't just be getting a flat fee for creating the content or whatever, right? you should be getting a percentage of the ad revenue that's going to come in off of that. And you think about it just like a musician, right? The songwriters, the producers, the artists, whoever's on the song, they get a piece of that song for fucking ever. You know what I mean? And I think that is the next turn for creators working in partnership with brands is residual income. How do I get in on the long-term ongoing revenue that is being generated off of me, right? 
versus me getting a quick ten thousand dollar cash grab to to make the shit cool it's evergreen it's going to be there five years from now you're getting page views you're leveraging those page views or views on the content or whatever to sell for ad revenue how am i i should be getting my little three five percent fifteen percent however the fuck you, you i don't know what what that would be but i should be getting that that's the next um that's also the next frontier so there's metrics that matter which are the conversation and the time spent and then there's also the residual income off of uh off of intellectual property those are the th that those are the two uh curves that we're getting around that are going to converge right these now, are these now. are good points i guess I don't understand fully what you do. So you know a lot about the negotiating nuances. So do you help like creators mm -hmm. negotiate their own things? Like tell us exactly what you do. How you work bag. Sounds like a bag on the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't do that because I feel like that's the job of a lawyer. Right. Um, so what I do, <laughs> I should always, I should really get better at being able to say this in two sentences. What I do is um, I'm, a, I'm a content strategist first, right? I, um, I focus on editorial strategy and direction, social media strategy, content development, and uh, performance analysis, right? So that whole world paints the picture for how brands should go about um, creating and mobilizing content to reach um, reach their uh, success metrics, right? So that is what I do 90% of the time, right? Now, off the back of that, I'm a, I'm a multimedia producer. So I write and I produce everything from articles to uh, a video series. I've done television specials. I've done um, uh, documentaries. Um, tap in, check out Magenta Edge, a documentary series happening right now, shameless plug. Uh, T-Mobile for Business, shout out. Anyway, um, so I, I basically leverage uh, cultural insights. <laughs> you just held up the phone. I basically leverage cultural insights um, that I gather through my research to create content when I write for different publications and when I, you know, um, interview certain people in different spaces. Um, I leverage that insight to inform my marketing and content strategy. And then I use data to back up um, my strategic approach, but I don't let data guide it or I don't let data dictate it. I let data guide, me. you know what I'm saying? Um, cause people are people, numbers are numbers. Right. Right. Um, so that's, that's the full scope of what I do now on the side. What happens is, oh, and I'm also a speaker. So I'll moderate and I'll, uh, lead discussions on different topics within, um, that are happening within the cultural space tech, typically at the convergence of like culture, technology and media. Right. Um, now what happens is, I always get people in my inbox kind of hitting me up because they just think I sound smart and they want to know, they want input on how they should move or do certain things or whatever. Um, so I would never say I'm a coach. I'm not, um, I would never say I'm a, I'm a, you know, um, like, yeah, yeah. I would never say I'm a coach, right? I'm not, I'm not that, but what I do do, and I never really charge for it because I just feel like, you know what I'm saying? We all, depending on who it is, depending on who it is. But I think we should all share knowledge. I'm not selfish with no, I'm not selfish with game. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I feel like, I feel like if you're not sharing knowledge with people, there's some insecurity going on there. I'm gonna get a bag anyway. That ain't, that ain't no shit I'm worried about. You know what I'm saying? But if somebody reaches out, I'm going to hear them out if I have the time and I'll try to point them in the right direction. Um, what I'm looking to move forward, what I am moving forward into right now is strategic advisory. Um, filling in as a, as a strategic advisor for different um, um, uh, content platforms, um, startups, things like that, that are looking, because everybody needs content now. I always said content strategy was going to be one of the most valuable roles that anybody, could. I've been a content strategist since, shit, 2011 back when I used to have to beg, I was at internships begging motherfuckers to start a YouTube channel for their business. And they're like, I oh, fuck that, go get coffee. You know what I'm saying? Cause I always knew this was gonna be the shit. Content is everywhere. Right. Even the new refrigerators with the, with the you got the food menu on the front and the nutritional facts and all that, that's content. 
the microwaves where you can touch the screen now and like it takes you on this whole consumer journey. That's content. Content isn't just about uh, entertainment value. It's how we, it's a utility that we use to, um, it's a utility that you, that we use at every point of the customer journey. You understand what I'm saying? Um, so I'm filling strategic roles at different, uh, at different um, companies and platforms to help them mobile, understand how to mobilize content in the best way possible to work with their, uh, their consumer funnel. So that's what I, that, that's the next, that's, that's the next phase. So, you know, uh, you know, and one of those, you know, what I'll be launching is a media group that, that basically, you know, has a conglomerate of uh, portfolio companies that, that we advise um, on how to mobilize content within their different, um, within the different elements of their business. Now that's dope, man. And, and when you were saying the new frontier about like how uh, brands or how creatives are, you know, going to kind of basically get residual income, what came to mind from a small business owner perspective is a way to accelerate and amplify your brand. So, so when you're like reaching out to influencers or whatever, like the same way a big brand would, it's like, hey, look, we are putting like, for example, I, we spend a substantial amount of money on ads every month for Melanin Money. So it's like, instead of me saying, doing a photo shoot and having to coordinate all that for the creators, it's like, hey, look, you can produce some fire ass content. You're going to be in our ad, right? So it's like, hey, look, we'll give you a percentage of the ads that you're in, like the winning ads, because we can track it all through Facebook, right? I think that's going to be a great way for smaller businesses to not have to come out of pocket so much to pay because like they don't have the big bag like the brands do. So they can be, they can kind of insert themselves ahead of the bigger brands who aren't doing it yet and getting some of those creators, if they can articulate it the right way, say, hey, look, right. and like, I, cause I can show people, I can say, hey, look, this is how much we spend on ads. This is the conversion rate, right? Like we think that you will be great to amplify our brand, but instead of paying you your normal $5,000, $7,000 rate to create this content, here's what we're willing to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And then showing them that I think smaller businesses can probably be a leader in that if they're mm -hmm. if they're willing to, you know, there's I mean? a middle ground to play. I feel like you're still going to have to you know, pay some form of some form of like upfront money for the service. Yeah. Right. But it can be like to your point, it can be less than, you know, the normal lump sum. If you can say, all right, and you and you and you know, you're going to have to prove like, all right, well, is that percentage uh, comparable to you know, what I'm producing, right? Is your, right. is your company in a position to actually drive? Like, cause what's, what's 10% of, if y'all make $800, you know what I'm saying? Like that's You have to obviously validate it, right? Yeah, you have to validate it, right? But, but I do, I mean, I agree with your point that that's, that's a, that's a, that's what's next, man. That's what's next. You heard yeah, it here. Don't be surprised, y'all I'm an executor. Don't be surprised by, by next month and I'll run that play. Run that shit. Yeah, I can. What? Next month, next week. It's Sunday. Today is Sunday. <laughs> Today is Sunday. We got. I'm dealing with right. You see, what I'm dealing with right. And we got to fix the strategy for next week. We don't. Oh. We don't wait around here. Implementation ASAP. Yeah, man. So many bars, man. Phenomenal episode. Quick question for you as we head out. Like, where can people find you? Where can they tap in? Um, you know, and then to just piggyback off of that real quick, what are you most excited about? Um, as we you know roll through 2021. Okay, um, you can find me uh, on Instagram and Twitter. Um, on Twitter, it's at devtsmith underscore. On Instagram, it's just at devtsmith. Um, you know, you can always check out, you know, uh, my latest work or, you know, projects I got going on. Or if you just want to learn more about what I do or services I provide or what I've done in the past uh, at devtsmith.com. Um, and what am I most excited about in 2020? I'm personally 2021, 2021, damn 2021. It's going to be 2022 <laughs> in three weeks and shit. Um, okay. So what am I most excited about in 2021? What I'm most excited about is moving personally is moving into, uh, uh, the next phase of my career, um, which is truly taking ownership of my time. Um, really, really setting up my, my, um, my different, um, my different um in, uh, endeavors to 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 serve like a a, a truly like entrepreneurial uh, um, lifestyle. Um, I've always been an advocate for um, you know I was never one of those people who was like oh well I just got to be an entrepreneur. You know what I mean? Like I've been a big fan of fucking up other people's money until I learn how to get it right. You know what I mean? 
So, uh, you know, I think I've spent the last six or seven years, you know what I mean, soaking up game, getting my wins, getting my losses, and uh, and now at this point, uh, doing things on a scale that, um, you know, I'm proven. Uh, so now I look forward to to moving into a space where I can, you know, like I said, be in more in a more strategic advisory role, um, start to uh, form my company in the way that I want to form it. Now that I, you know, I, I I'm mature enough and have enough experience to know exactly what what space I want to own and what space I want to serve in. Um, and when I own that time, um, moving into a space where I can create a media platform that I think um, uh, serves to solve that problem that I talked about earlier, which is uh, uh, providing proper context to the um, the topics and conversation and, and news that we receive um, so that we can better inform our purchase and uh, our behaviors as consumers and as audiences um, and, and lend that um, and leverage that to, to help help brands be truly more authentically impactful. Um, so that that's what I'm looking forward to this year is just like really being intentional and carving out that space and owning that next part of that journey and taking that leap whenever it's, ne it's necessary to take it. Um, and, for, and just in terms of just culture and in terms of just media in general, um, I just look forward to like what's, what's coming next. I'm a fan of this shit at the end of the day. You know what I mean? So I'm looking forward to new music. I'm looking forward to new movies and documentaries. I'm looking forward to seeing, I'm looking forward to seeing who like, who, who's gonna run the table next. We've seen a lot of, you know, familiar names over the last couple of years in different spaces, kind of just like being, being at the forefront. And I think there's always a shift coming. And I think that's happening now. I think we got a reset last year. You know what I'm saying? So I'm looking forward to seeing what that, what that looks like. And, and you know what I mean? I, I, you know, George, I always say I, I drop an album a year. So, yeah. you know, I dropped one with T-Mobile. We doing numbers, we good. So I'm just, you know, I'm looking forward to figuring out, you know, when's the next time I step on the court so I can drop 50 on niggas real quick. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I love it, man. I, man. I think you said a, a bar for people who are considering entrepreneurship and you said, fuck up somebody else's money before you fuck up your own or potentially fuck up your own. I think that's a good point because so so many times people just jump into like entrepreneurship and they're like, all right, here I am, entrepreneurship, make that's, me money. That's an ego thing. It's an ego <laughs> thing. And I think that people for uh, mistake uh, wanting autonomy for wanting entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. What you really want is to own your time and your lifestyle, right? Exactly. Not necessarily to run your own business. Right. Mm -hmm. And I also think that we we have to, again, as microwave society, we forget. I mean, God willing, you got a life to live. So, like, there's no point in rushing to accomplish everything in the first decade of your actual adulthood. You're mm -hmm. not leaving yourself nothing to look forward to. And you're going to cap out. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's a whole nother era for you. You know what I'm saying? And if you spend the first 10, seven to 10 years, just like I said, or, you know, taking your lumps learning what you need to learn, fucking up other people's money while you do it, then you got a whole nother 10 year run to actually set up what you want to do in an informed way. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And that's that's the that's the, the, the frame of thought that I want to see us as as creators and as those of us who have an entrepreneurial spirit. I want us to uh, to to take on that that thought process as just because you saw five people you know, launch a business and end up on Forbes 30 under 30, you know what I'm saying? They're anomalies. And if you look at that 30 under 30 list in another 10 years, we're going to see who actually had a thriving business and who just had a good publicist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the Uncensored show. He's uncensored. We love it. That's real shit. Speaking of which, uh, the last question we'd always like to ask everybody is, what does living life uncensored mean to you? <laughs> Oh man, um, what does living life uncensored mean to me? Um, being exactly who you are at all times, right? And I think everybody is is susceptible to 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 um, conform conforming. Mm -hmm. It happens. Nobody's above it, right? But I think living life uncensored means just being who you are and what you represent 100% of the time. You know what I'm saying? One, one thing I try to always do is I don't do no code switching. I'm this in any meeting with anybody. You know what I'm saying? 
because it's not about how I sound when I say things. It's not about my mannerisms. It's about what I say. And that shit's always gold. So, you know what I mean? I think living life on sensitive is always being your 100% authentic self. I know everybody likes to use the word unapologetic, but but truly like like being that because that's freedom. You know what I'm saying? Your frustration, frustration often comes from, from caging yourself in, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and trying to walk a fine line so you can be digestible. Fuck that shit. Be you, you know what I'm saying? And, and you will see that you will attract opportunities and people that are perfectly fine and comfortable and aligned with how it is with, with, with the way that you function. You know what That's nice. We see it every day, right? With like people like Cardi B or people like who are truly themselves. It's like, damn, how are they able to like move, how they move in and get, because because they, the, intrinsically people crave or that really desire mm-hmm. that they could be authentically themselves. So when they see somebody else doing it, it's like, it reminds them of what they want. And like, they actually even attract you, you you'll be surprised what you attract. So like, I agree with that wholeheartedly. 100%. Well, peace, guys. This was a good one. Uh, Thanks, Dev, for all the gems. Until next time, peace. Appreciate y'all, man. Thanks for having me.